Um, first of all, uh, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Danny Jenkins. I'm the CEO of Threat Locker. And my background before Threat Locker was very much on the enterprise defense side. I've been founded multiple security companies, and I've also acted as an ethical hacker to help companies see the weaknesses in their business. I'd like to introduce uh, Pete Peterson and Gabe Miller as well. I'll hand over to you guys. Pete, go ahead. Hey, I'm Pete Peterson. I'm the CEO of Merit 2.0. We're a cybersecurity and IT help desk firm with offices in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, and Providence in Southern Massachusetts in New England. Yep, Gabriel Miller, uh, CISO of the organization. Uh, my background has actually been mostly in the enterprise space uh, in the federal and local government. Um, so I've been actively involved in MSP for the past three years, but I was heavily on compliance, cybersecurity, and uh, data center technologies. So what we want to do today is really talk about what does it take to build a successful cybersecurity stack? Because cybersecurity has become this big stress that nobody's achieving anything and everyone's just running around like headless chickens at the moment saying, well, what do I do? How can I, how can I actually stop these threats from happening? But it's also still a real problem and it's, it's getting worse every year on year. So I've got a number of topics I want to talk about, but before we begin, you know, guys, do you have any initial thoughts where you feel the biggest weaknesses are, the biggest threats to small, large businesses around the globe at the moment? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, here we are, zero trust security. You know, um, it's it's an essential, it's got to be an essential part of, of every company's strategy. You know, the approach involves, you know, treating all users, devices and application as potential threats. I mean, we're there, right? Um, you know, we, we, it requires continuous verification, verification of identities and access privileges. Um, it's just it's just the new normal that we live in at this point. Um, you know, I, I hate to say that being on the threat locker, uh, you know, talk about this, but it but it really is a, a significant deal. I mean, we've seen a, a change in the industry that goes from a a passive uh, involvement that that MSPs and enterprises have, where we deploy stuff and we wait for things to happen. Um, we really, we really have, have shifted the gears and gone to an active engagement or an active environment where we have to be proactive, right? We have to tell the user that no, what they just downloaded from the internet, they can't actually run because it's yeah. it's not what they're supposed to be doing. So um, that's a, a, a seismic shift in the industry, um, and and completely changes the game in how we a, a address risk and and threats in this environment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting, Danny. I was thinking about um, the other great Irish poet besides Jenkins, um, Yeats. In, 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 in a poem, he says, the center cannot hold, right? So something's failing. What is it? And then they talk about the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So our enemies are full of passionate intensity, but we have... Uh, business owners, small business owners who lack conviction to do something. So it's a really interesting paradigm shift as the mentality goes from the sidelines to proactive. We have to be active in our defense. Well, uh, look, th there's a lot changed in the last 20 years. In 20 years, if you had asked me 20, 20, someone said to me yesterday, 93 was 30 years ago. And I was like, am I that old? <laughs> I, uh, and, but if we, if we think back uh, 20, 20 years, we, we, as a business, whether actually even large businesses, I work for a large corporation. And I remember being in the boardroom and I remember having a discussion about data protection and, and things like this. And they weren't concerned about being hacked. They weren't concerned about being shut down. They weren't concerned about their cyber thing. Literally, the CFO asked what the biggest fine had ever been issued under the Data Protection Act was, and it was like ten thousand pounds. And he said, "We'll just pay the fine." This is like that, that. They didn't care. And and back then, attacks weren't really trying to get to companies that weren't Bank of America or J.P. Morgan. They were. They really weren't focused. But today, you know, we see small businesses that crippled every single day of the week, where someone got into their system, stole their data, encrypted their files, locked them out. And then suddenly they can't process their patient's records or they can't uh, take orders or their customer's credit cards are stolen. And it's it's real losses now. So And businesses have to realize that I'm fighting a different war than I was 20 years ago. Well, yeah, but let's, let's come up to the higher level for a minute. Whose data is it, Danny? Because it's not the business owner. It, you use the medical practice as an example. It's not their data. It's their patients. 
It's their patient's name and address and date of birth and social and their insurance and their banking. Every single piece of data within the repository of the example you use for a doctor, it don't belong to them. It's their coworkers, banking information and payroll data. So if your mindset is, well, I don't care if I don't protect my data, I, I suppose fine, but it's not your data that were you being asked to be the steward of. It's the heavy burden and responsibility of caring for the people who've trusted you. And look, a lot of people don't care. And that's that's a sad fact about it. But what our attackers have realized is, uh, let's take something a little bit more personal than patient data. We'll talk about a construction site. I remember an MSP asking us, hey, I've got this plumbing company and they really don't believe they need security because their customers come in and they order these things and then we were able, we went out and we literally said, well, has there been other plumbing companies hit? And we were able to find multiple cases of plumbing companies getting hit. They're saying, well, their customers weren't concerned, but the problem is, is the plumbing companies had to pay the ransom, millions of dollars of ransom, because they couldn't continue to function because they'd lost everything they needed to function. Their tax returns, their, their data, their customers' data, their contact numbers, their invoices. And what, what these bad guys have realized is even those who don't personally care, care about the operation of their business because it's someone else's data you're right but it's also the operation of their business and they don't realize that people are trying to take them down dental offices hospitals car dealerships i mean car dealerships again i mean think about an old school industry you know the typical car salesman i mean think about the data they hold and the value and you think someone who sells hundreds of cars every single month suddenly can't process orders they're, they're and of course as they're big targets because They've got credit card information, social security information, and when they can't sell cars, they're willing to pay the ransom. Well, in the United States, actually, they're they're starting to fall under the the FTC program for for cybersecurities because they have so much informa- financial information and, and banking information that that they use. So there there is a convergence in that space, specifically with 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 auto dealers, which which is great. Um, we have a number of clients that are actually auto dealers, so we, we've dealt with this directly. But, you know, the other part of this is just the just the, the, the gathering of source information. So you bring up a plumbing company. Um, we, have, we have plumbing, HVAC, who have federal contracts with the United States. Now, they may have base layouts, um, building schematics for, you know, nation state or or other third-party entities, that can be some great open source intelligence to get in order to look at escalation or different attacks based on the different organizations that they're actually employed by. So there's a lot of if-ands that come with a lot of these attacks. And sometimes it's hard to draw the line to to your customer at at that point of saying, hey, you really need to, to look at what you know, what the butterfly effect is based on losing your customer's data. Like who else are you putting at risk? Is it lives? It's other people's jobs. It's, you know, the impact can be significant down the line. I want to talk about patching because patching is one of those things that has evolved uh, and more and more, I mean, 22, I, I haven't checked 2022s, but 2021's CV database contended contained 21,000 known vulnerabilities found and fixed. Um, and, and that's typically what CVEs are. They've created a the vulnerability being found, and normally there's a fix for those. Uh, vulnerabilities essentially allow attackers to get onto systems, uh, and some of those are pretty benign. They're, they're very difficult to exploit. They're, you're using Microsoft Office, and you'd have to have the data ingested, or you're using um, some random program like like Log4J, for example. Lots and lots of vulnerabilities there, but many of the programs weren't exploitable because they didn't ingest data and they weren't publicly available on the internet. Others were very exploitable. I feel like one of the most important things you should be doing if you're running an IT department, if you're an MSP, if you're looking after people's data, is patching software where there's known security vulnerabilities. And I say known because you can't fix what's not known but patching software across the board. Do you have any thoughts on that and why it's so difficult? Why you know, this has been an issue for so many years now. We see so many servers on the internet not patched. We see so many versions of Office and Chrome and not patched. And what's causing the delay? Uh, yeah, the, the delay is, is that uh, patching can, can be pretty impactful to the end user. Um, if 
if customers have legacy applications that aren't compatible with with particular updated versions of anywhere from .NET to, you know, the Java runtime, um, a patch can cause significant business interruption, uh, which of course is revenue. So it's a liability for for the IT personnel to go ahead and and patch systems regularly because you're probably going to break things regularly. Um, now, what what larger enterprises have done is they have an, an advanced change management system. They file ITIL processes. They they target, you know, a, a smaller set of systems to go after in order to test that the patch worked and then roll it out to a larger a larger organization. But when you're in the the SME environment, you don't you don't have the you know the funding or 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 even test systems to do that with. So, I mean, you're you're making changes live. Right, and you're gonna yeah. have to, you're gonna have to, you know, put up with the outcomes based on whether it's whether it was a good experience or a bad experience to your end right. users. Right. So if you're the small MSP and you're one, two, three, four people in your organization, some guy patches, right? He stays up all night. He's bleary eyed. He's done all the patches, and then the guys in the morning thought they were gonna have work that they wanted to get done, and instead they're answering the phone trying to fix things that broke from every patch. If you don't stay on top of it, it's going to be a lengthy and frustrating exercise for both your coworkers as the MSP and for every end user at that enterprise. Uh, and it's compounding right. as well, because look, every patch that's released has a small, and it's a very small risk that something will go wrong, very rarely. I mean, I think about the thousands of patches we've deployed and how many of them actually caused a problem in history. And it's, it's very, very small. But if you've got to a situation where you've gone, from Windows in, in 2019, and now suddenly you're trying to bring it up to 2023, every issue that m may have occurred in four years is now going to occur in one day, which obviously yeah. <laughs> changes the, the situation. But generally speaking, if you deploy security patches, I mean, not here, I want the latest version of Windows with the start button moved into a different part of the screen. And, you know, but if, if you focus on, hey, I want to make sure every security patch is deployed yeah. Pretty quickly, depending on the severity on it, what the likelihood of me being affected as, as quick as possible. I mean, we review everything that comes out in Threat Locker and we say, okay, this is a vulnerability in Windows. It's not publicly facing. Um, no, we're able to mitigate using this. We're able to put it through test systems in a much slower pace. That, whereas, oh, this is a zero day that allows an attacker point to point at our server and exploit something, we need to get it out right now. But if you're able to do that, if you've got an MSP or an IT provider that's able to do that for you, then, and you keep on top of it, it shouldn't be bad, but it's also, it does expose risk and it is very, very important. Yeah, it, it yeah. shouldn't be bad. It, it's, you know, you, you don't train for a marathon the day before the event, right? It's 26 miles, you build up to it. And the same thing with patching. If I'm the CFO of an organization, I want my IT department showing me a report every month on where we stand on every device and its patch status. And that way, it just becomes part of your hygiene. You know, you got your PL, you got your balance sheet, you got your, your um, vendors to pay, and you have your accounts receivable. And here's my patch status. Yeah. Patching, by not patching, you're just incurring technical debt. Right, you're gonna have to pay it back sometime. Um, you know, I I always say, hey, you know, if you want technical debt, it's like kicking a can. When it starts out, it's a soup can. The next time you do it, you kick it down the road, it's the size of a soda can. The next time, it's a paint can. The next it's time, a it's a five gallon bucket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it and it compounds and it and it, it gets a lot harder. To Pretty soon, it's stuff. the Guinness Brewery. Yeah. yeah it, yeah, I know. But, you know, the thing is, too, is also about the the governance attitude of the organization. Sometimes the culture in senior management just doesn't know or isn't it, it hasn't been convinced that this is something that needs to be done. Updating uh, you, you think it's fair for a CEO to ask whether it's an internal IT department or whether it's a MSP? Oh, show me my patch report. Show me an update of where my servers, where my workstations are, what's out of date, what's hit. Uh, on a monthly basis of course of course of course you know it, it's it, business strategy is not hoping right business strategy is writing down a plan and coming up with the tactics for success you can't just wish your way into compliance it has to become part of your dna as the ceo or the cfo or the cto or whatever it happens to be so 
absolutely categorically, it's yes. You know, we've got a saying, Danny, absence of complaint is not proof of perfection. Sometimes you find your coworkers got so tired of complaining about things because they weren't getting fixed, they just quiet down. And so if the CFO thinks to herself, well, people aren't complaining, so things must be good, that's a, that's a, that's a, false, that's a false hope. Look, as a CEO, I worry about two things. Uh, one is how do we continue to grow and develop the business? And the other thing is how do we protect the business? And that, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a technical CEO, but I get to, you know, I am constantly looking at reports of where are we checking, asking people yeah. to do simulated recoveries on data centers, because they're the things that end my business. A cyber attack is the thing that ends your business. Uh, so, and you want to make sure you mitigate that risk. So you're talking KPIs. How is that just not another KPI? How is that not, a, not another metric that's measured and presented to the C-level suite every month? But the C-level suite, I mean, you, you're talking, I mean, you may be talking someone who's a who's a, the original business owner, you know, the original starter of the business. Um, they might just not have the aptitude to ask those questions in the area because they're worried about cash flow and production and revenue and keeping the people that they have working for them, you know, you know, fed and housed. So you know, there's a lot of other, as you know, there's a lot of other things that pull you away from CEO, you know, as a CEO than just worrying about a patch report. So, you know, it's our responsibility to to educate those those leaders, those business leaders, about what the nuance of those of those of those metrics are and why they should quickly look at them and 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 sense those trends. So if you're an IT guy as well, you're an MSP, you're an IT guy, you should be delivering this to your customers, to your board, to your CEO, whoever the relevant person is, because it also shows value for you. One of the problems I had working in corporate IT is I remember going in and asking for a pay rise. And I went in and I had this big list of everything I'd done and we deployed Active Directory on 146 sites with centralized on exchange and done all this. And, and, and then I asked for a pay rise. And one of the things on the bottom of the list was I renegotiated with the mobile provider, the cellular provider in Ireland at the time, and we reduced the, the bill by 60 or 70 grand a year. And the CFO was just like, well, you know, I'm not saying this sort of stuff's not important, but you've, you've saved me money here, so I'm willing to give you a pay rise. <laughs> so, and, and some, now back then patching, there wasn't that many patches and it wasn't like it is now, but if you can produce a report, if you're an IT guy and you can produce a report, this is all of the risks we had. This is how we mitigated them. It, it makes you more valuable in the company. So you should deliver it whether they want it or not and say, here, here's your report. This is all the risks. This is why we fixed it. And, you know, put a little bit of, um, the, the fear behind it as well and say this is what could have happened if this hadn't been patched here's an example yeah. um, um uh, so yeah. danny the, the, you know we we say the trend is your friend and if you're not looking at the trend you don't know where your friend is so those metrics are key and you have to have access to them i want i want to move on to allow listening because i want i want to get through the the, the upsetting ones <laughs> malware is software and, and and it's not just malware the software we just did a report for one of our customers and we're, we're we're working on this new reporting engine actually that it allows customers to see what their risks are based on the data that's collected in the threat locker agent and we just created a beta report for one of our big enterprise customers and it, it shows things like hey you've got machines that aren't working you've uh, that aren't they're in learning mode you've got you're misusing your learning mode too long you've got bad policies in place you've created custom rules it shows all sorts of cool things like that but it also shows things like hey you're running uh, 212 um chrome extensions in your organization these ones are considered bloatware coupon clippers uh, uh you know things that have no value for your business but expose risk but right at the bottom of the report we, we also or not in the bottom right in the report and Here's, here's the ones that were written by Russian companies. Here's the ones that were written by Chinese companies. And we're, we're providing that and we're doing it as a beta program as well for a few customers. And the, the idea is we bring this out as part of the threat locker service. Now, it was terrifying because the amount of Chrome extensions and software running that was just bloatware and had no relevance that was written in Russia and written in China. And these are the risks with this. Now, we're not saying that software was bad. But malware software, this type of unwanted software exposes your companies at risk. Companies have to get control of the software they're running. Users just downloading and running a program on your computer allows that program to access all of your data, all of your files, all of your web history, and you need to make sure it's controlled. Allow listings, obviously, the solution to that. 
the way it works, for those who aren't aware, it's true zero trust. No software is trusted unless the business has signed off on it. And then the IT department or the MSP manages that process and says, okay, you requested a new program. It's a piece of ransomware. We're denying it. Or it's a remote access tool. We're denying it. It's a business app that you need in the business. We're approving it. Now, it's also contentious because users previously could install any Chrome extensions they wanted, any games they wanted, and now they're being challenged. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think... Uh... You know, we're 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 really starting to understand the 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 true risk factor, right? You know, it's oh, it's always been like that. I mean, the the internet has always been open, right? And people expect it. They don't they don't really see a break between, you know, being at their house and being at work. Um, you know, at, you live day to day. I mean, how many times have you ever shopped Amazon while you were, you know, in your office? I mean, because you needed to either change your subscribe and save or or order something else for the kids. It, it doesn't, th th there isn't that that separation of, of duties, if you will, between the two. And, you know, the vulnerabilities and exposures that are out there are, are the same across the entire environment. So, Every risk that you have as, you know, as your, your mother-in-law, like my mother-in-law, who's 85, who clicks on every single thing she sees on the internet <laughs> to, to, you know, my wife who, who I've trained very well in cybersecurity, who doesn't click anything. Right. Um, so, but the thing is, is that you can't get around that environment. You have to, you have to address it in both spaces. So you have to look at the worst case scenario. And when you look at the worst case scenario, it's like, well, how disciplined are you really when it comes to cyber, right? And and we've proven over and over again that we're not very good at it. So it's time to leverage the automation. It's time to leverage the enforcement, you know, let the device manage it. Um, you know, with my mother-in-law, I say, hey, don't use your laptop, use your iPad. Why? Because the iPad is a, is a walled garden at this point. There's really not a lot of damage she can do. I mean, she can do some damage, but when it comes to cleaning up viruses and ransomware, I don't have to deal with it anymore. So leverage the technology, leverage, leverage the software vendors, leverage, leverage the hardware in order to get it fixed. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. One of, one of the driving factors behind the creation of ThreatLocker, the creation of an allow listing tool that blocks by default, uh, was my kid's school. My kids go to school. Uh, we were looking after their IT. I say we, my wife was mostly doing the work. <laughs> and uh, the, the thing is, is they had a constant fight with malware. They had a constant, and, and some of it was like ad pop-ups and it was a school. It was an elementary school. It was middle school. So the middle school was the kids. The elementary school was the teachers. And they were constantly getting pop-ups and then email bots and uh, things like that. And it was like, we got to stop this. And it was not once a month or once every two months. It was once a week. And you know, they were one of the first users of ThreatLocker software and they haven't had a piece of malware, any pop-up since then and that their environment's safe now the kids don't get pop-ups they don't have malware there's no nuisance software it really does work allow listing if you take control of the software it can run you stop shadow it so you stop people doing whatever they want and they're coming to the business saying hey i need a pdf reader or i need a pdf writer uh, and you also stop malware from running in your environment yeah but danny so the f businesses and people fear what they don't know and the fear is well, if I have to hit allow, how long do I wait for my IT partner to allow that? And so is it two minutes? Is it five minutes or is it the next day? Um, what we find is having an instant response, having a cyber response unit is really important. And Gabriel and I were talking about this um, between full-time cyber response engineers and the amount of mind share that our C-suite and senior engineers spend on cybersecurity is, as you know, a small MSP with 32 employees, 25% of our resources are now cyber response or cyber focused, if you will, including being able to get to people back to people quickly. So this goes back to the very first conversation we had. It's proactive versus reactive. We're not just changing somebody's password. Yeah, I think that's important. You've got to have a good IT team that's responsive. And if you don't have a good IT team, outsource it either to an MSP or if you use the threat like a cyber heroes who have very, very quick service levels to reply and say, okay, this is our business policy. When somebody needs something, if it's inside the policy, it's going to get allowed. If it's outside the policy, it's not going to get allowed. Uh, but it is important to have that team behind you. So when you do need to change, but the reality is people shouldn't need to change the software they run very often. 
I want to talk about supply chain attacks. Um, last month, 3CX was compromised. There was malware pushed out through 3CX. Uh, and this is not a vulnerability. To classify the difference, a vulnerability is an unintentional feature in a piece of software uh, uh, that, or a hole in the code that allowed an attacker to do something uh, by injecting code or doing a buffer overflow. But um, the, the 3CX situation is somebody, they accidentally, we don't have the details on how, but somehow they managed to bundle malware with their software. They're a good company uh, by nature. They're a phone company. It's trusted software. You allow it. Um, and, and we saw SolarWinds Orion a few years ago, and we've seen numerous other products. But what are your thoughts on how can you protect from supply chain compromise uh, what's important when you're choosing vendors and is the things you can do to reduce the risk and what are the other the other areas you can cover? So you really have to include your third party vendors now as part of your your risk um, surface. Uh, you know, the idea was prior and this is where a lot of people thought, hey, we'll just go to the cloud. It's it's more secure is that you're you're just doing risk transfer. Right. You're saying, hey, I have this line of business application that I really need to use. It's critical to my revenue streams. And I'm going to buy somebody who can host it for me. Right. I'm going to go with one that, that's a SaaS solution or something and put it out there. And now it I've just transferred all of my risk to that company. Well, what we're finding out is, is that, you know, they're just as vulnerable as everybody else in the organization. And what's really neat about these new supply chain hacks is that you know, these, these nation state threat actors or large threat actors is that they're, they're casting a huge net, right? They're saying, okay, we're going to have 700,000 installs of this, of this application, but we're going to look and look for, you know, the top 10 most important targets that have been compromised, right? Is that someone high up in the banking industry? Is that someone, you know, within the federal government or, or you know, na na national government? Is it, you know, is it, uh, you know, are they journalists? You know, where where's the value of these of these targets that we're looking at? So when they come in and gain persistence, there's a much more nuanced um, effect of just saying, hey, we're just going to ransomware 700,000 people and y'all need to pay us. It's more of like, where can we get, you know, the true value of this data without causing too much noise, right? We don't want the security industry to learn about what we're doing because we want to maintain our persis persistence. We want to continue what we're doing. We want to stay ahead of that group. We don't want to give de develop our secrets so they can create something that that requires us to create you know, a, a new payload or a new package in order to gain persistence. So, But, but I think that's the difference, though, in, in approaches. And when we look back at the Kaseya, and that was a vulnerability in 2021, the, the, the attackers found out about the vulnerability. They cataloged it over and over. They, they went off and they cataloged as many servers as they could and then hit as many people as they could in the shortest pull with a big bang. We're going to throw ransomware at everything. And, and, you know, in fairness to say, they were really, really quick at responding and look if it'd been four hours later if the the attacker planned it for the fourth of july weekend because they realized that the ability for kaseya to respond was going to be limited because people were out on vacation the it department wouldn't be able to respond now in fairness kaseya picked it up very early and, and the attacker hit about four hours too early in my mind because it, they, they well or, or to uh, the right time in my mind i guess but if they were <laughs> if they wanted to be successful that they they should have gone four hours later because it would be much harder to respond and shut that down. Whereas in the 3CX, there, there didn't appear to be any major, I'm going to push out ransomware, but like you said, they're right. collecting data. And, and there, there's definitely a different approach. Now, the other approach is send this beacon out to everyone. They're going to call home and then we're going to we're going to pick and choose and it, what we're going to do. And quite often they'll, they'll with precision, go through and find uh, data, they'll extract data. And I want to talk about ring fencing around this. And the other way is they'll, then, then they'll say on the way out the door, I'm out, boom. <laughs> and then we're just going to cause mass damage on the way out. And because we've yeah. now been caught and we've got 700,000 endpoints with a piece of malware running on, and we can just pull the grenade. But come, but Danny, come back up a level because 3CX is a VOIP phone, right? And so it could be a handset. It could be a soft phone on your computer. It could be your home computer. As well as your as well as your handheld, as well as um, a smartphone. So the Internet of Things has expanded the threat lens landscape exponentially, right? And so this does tie into ring fencing. It does tie into to um, 
whitelisting because the, the threat landscape is exponentially larger and scary. Now, if we think about, uh, yeah, now the, the thing is with the 3CX, in this case, it was the malware was pushed to the computers. Um, now, the, of course, it also gets into someone could listen and, and there was no evidence and there was no indication that that happened, but someone can now listen to my conversations. They can get my data. Now, I also don't want to set the world on fire here, but the sky's not falling. I mean, for an attacker to be profitable, I mean, attackers have to make money. Like sitting there and listening to hundreds of thousands of conversations just isn't going to make them money. It's just going to be really boring in most cases. Uh, but it is expanding and it is saying, well, now I can get onto all these devices and get onto servers. And, you know, I feel like look, what what can you do? First of all, check your vendor. And, and I haven't reviewed the 3CX SOC 2 report. I'm sure they have one. Um, I'm sure there's exceptions in it. There are always. And just because someone comes up with a clean SOC 2 report or a clean audit, it doesn't mean they're great. But do check that when you're choosing vendors. Um, you know, I've, the security companies out there that, you know, I, I heard of one a few weeks ago, just got their SOC 2 report. It's like, how many years did it take you to get a SOC 2 report and you're a security company? <laughs> like, if you're not doing the most, but every company you, you're doing business with, that you put their software on your computer, it can access your data. So what you can do to reduce those risks is one is you can audit them or you, no one's got, you haven't got the resources to audit them, but you can review their, the results of their audit from their SOC 2 auditor. If they don't have one, then you have to start saying, well, how do I mitigate the risk? So I can use things like ring fencing to say, hey, this software doesn't need to see, like 3CX only needs to be able to go out the internet and make voice calls. It doesn't need to see my files. It doesn't need to see my network. So you should be doing that with every application, limiting what it can do to only, so when it is compromised, and I say when, because at some point, one of your applications gets compromised, it can't step out of its lane. That's exactly right. It, it's even, it's it's endemic to, to the software industry, um, right? We, we build things by standing on the shoulders of others, right? We're talking about shared libraries, open source, um, you know, paid for libraries. We're always using components to build stuff that, that our end users interact with. And a lot of those libraries and applications include other dependencies. So as we look at the inheritance chain and the risk chain that goes down with it, it's not only what your vendors are using, but it's how, what, what other you know, uh, third-party inputs that they're using that impacts it, right? So you're exactly right. You have to be able to compartmentalize one application to one set of, you know, uh, instances or priorities or or interfaces if you will that they can that they can speak over and that's it and you know it's it's almost like getting back to the old microcomputer days where you have a single application that runs in a single terminal of old old time you know the green screens and and that's what we're trying to get back to we're just trying to deploy it now on a completely dynamic individualized machine that you know, we don't that you can go get at Costco or Walmart or whatever. So it's it's tough. It's That's really tough. I want to, I want to talk about open ports. So and, and this is and I almost think this goes back into the allow listing as well because so many cyber attacks. Uh, I mean, you, the way cyber attacks seem to come in is through software, through bad patching, through open ports, and through identity, which we're going to talk about more. But open ports on firewalls, and of course RDP being the worst, and RDP is a port that you should be really, really scared of. But a lot of companies are saying, well, hey, I need to allow my customers to access their desktops from home. And I need to allow them remote access. And what happened was MSPs got much better and IT departments got much better at closing those port 3389s down. And then what happened is we saw a bunch of team viewers being installed <laughs> on machines and, and they got in through team viewer instead. But Open ports, I mean, I think it's pretty much agreed that you should close RDP down. Now, there has to be other strategies. Like the, the, we don't, the job of IT isn't to stop the business functioning. It's how do we provide the user with the functions they need? So what we saw is RDP should be shut down. Other strategies in my mind, well, how do I give them access to their desktop or, or to their remote desktop server or to whatever they're using in the office? The strategies in my mind are VPN, which comes with this whole new bag of worms, um, going into um, publishing an RD gateway under proper circumstances, uh, you know, port 443, um, having dual factor on that gateway uh, before authentication, um, or uh, uh, and then in my mind, using a combination of what I call uh, dynamic ACLs, which is what we offer on our 
endpoint security is we're only open ports, even when you've got a gateway to devices or IP addresses that you need to open them to. Because quite often what happens is somebody opens a port and they say, okay, this is a secure port. So VPN being a perfect example, we open up a VPN port, someone connects to the VPN server, this is a secure port, Intel does a log for J vulnerability and then people can create accounts on the VPN and then get on your whole network. So my thoughts are, when you're opening ports, whether they're RDP, whether they're your exchange server, whether they're, look, you shouldn't open RDP, whether it's an RDP gateway, you should use ACLs to limit the IP addresses that can get to them. And if you can't do that because they're dynamic, use dynamic ACLs in threat lockers network controls. Yeah, so uh, prior prior to being in the MSP, uh, when I was working for an insurance company, I supported 25 um, active users on RDP. So we're talking multiple RDP farms, uh, load balance technologies in front of it, like, uh, you know, Kemp or loadbalancer.org. Um, you know, that, that was it. That's how the, the business presented um, their application to, to their end users. And there was a lot of those issues going on. I mean, to say, you know, to go to that company, which is over a billion dollars in, in, in premium, insurance premium, to say, hey, you have to close down your RDP ports, you know, just, you know, the, there's no business viability at that point anymore. So like you're saying, those alternative technologies and what they are compensating controls in order to mitigate the risk factor, right? Um, I think, you know, I have I have tons of experience in this, especially with Citrix too, saying that, you know, there, there was a big change when Microsoft moved their RDP technologies around. It used to be really easy to set up an RDP server with a TS gateway or an RD web. It wasn't, it wasn't complex. Once you hit 2016 and 2019, now you have to create a load balancing infrastructure inside the RDP, um, you know, environment. It, it's not, it's not click, click, click done, right? So, you know, for, for people who don't have the time, they're just going to enable 3389 on the local machine RDP and then port forward to it. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, that Microsoft did us wrong. I'm just saying that in order to implement it safely, it it takes a lot more work to implement it safely at that point. The Microsoft do a really good job of making sure people need to be certified in Windows. <laughs> two, <laughs> two, two, two basic things. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, you, that's always the, the the joke around it. But um, you know, it it it's it, RD, RDP is difficult, but any ports are difficult. You know, you have the same risks, like you said. You know, you know, log for J. Um, you know, there could be an, an IIS zero day that comes out that's being hosted exchange. on the. I mean, that's what exchange was. It was IIS zero day, and that yep. could crypto lock your entire domain just by not patching your exchange server. Um, exactly. So you really have to leverage those those extra technologies. Now, you know, I used, you know, to, to tell you, I mean, it was heavy. I used, you know, mandatory profiles. You know, we deleted sessions when they were done. We also, so, <laughs> you know, what the, the the greatest thing about Threat Locker that I like, and and this this is not an endorsement. So if you came up to me on the street before this, and if we were in a customer, I would say this is that uh, software allow lists through group policies is the most frustrating, confusing thing to put together in your entire life. It really isn't workable. Um, it can be done. Totally can be done. I did it. I have a lot of gray hair because of it. Um, because that was those were years before we saw the commoditization of, you know, security software like Threatwalker coming down to the enterprise space, right? We we fought through it. You know, we wrote huge group policies to say, Hey, you know, you're not allowed to run Chrome, or you're not allowed to download a Chrome extension. Um, you're not allowed to run a command.exe. And it was just, I mean, it was just a PhD level of 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 knowledge in order to get your group policies working correctly in that environment. But you know, now fortunately, you can leverage the third party um, space in order to provide that capability, nearly turnkey, which is which is fantastic. Great. I want to talk about Office 365, G Suite, you know, everyone's moving to the cloud. And by the way, it's a smart thing to do. You can't expect a business with 10 employees to maintain and patch exchange servers and IIS and Windows and Active Directory. It's just not viable. So we see more and more people moving to the cloud, Office 365 being used more. That exposes a lot of risks. Um, and what can companies do to mitigate that risk in your mind? 
it's a it's a different train of thought at that point. Um, really, it, there's there's two new design principles that that specifically come around it. And you know, the first one is is using like a, a cloud access security broker, right? Um, you know, it's a it's a solution that that provides like visibility control over like the cloud services within the organization. Um, so like it can act as a gatekeeper about you know a governance model of what what it's supposed to be doing and what's being monitored and how things are enforced. The second thing is using like a, a workload protection platform, uh, and and that can provide like protection for your RDP sessions or your applications or your native cloud services that are running out there. Um, you know, and that can use behavioral analysis, um, threat intelligence, um, you know, to try to to try to help protect those workloads that are out there. So so it's a different, it's a di really different model that that we're not used to. But what one of the big things that I've seen over and over again is the lack of dual factor on Office 365. Uh, or G Suite or whatever the choice is. I, I mean, it, I feel like that should be something that's an absolute minimum. If you're using any service that's accessible from the internet, whether it's host, self-hosted or whether it's hosted in the cloud, put dual factor on it because users can be fished very, very easily. And it, it, we're going to have a, we're, we're going to have a conversation. We'll probably finish out on a conversation on training because that's where we started just before we started the webinar. <laughs> but it, it, would that be a, a safe assumption that make sure you've got good password policies and dual factor authentication on all of your Office 365 tenants? One thing from a business perspective, from the CEO or CFO, multi-factor is a great thing. You've just got to, you've got to be strong enough to push down to your workforce that you have to allow multi-factor on a device. And that became a thing for some companies whose employees were over, what did you say, Danny, 1993 is a long time ago? Yeah. Uh, I, I believe we agreed it was 30 years ago or more. Yeah. So for workforces that have been at an enterprise, the same company since 1992, um, there were people that didn't want to allow their, their, their cell phone to receive either the token or to, to add an app. But you're either in business to succeed or you're in business to fail. And those conversations can be pushed down from a C-suite now much more easily than even just five years ago. So, so that's on the MFA part. Gabe, I, I, I interrupted you on the, uh, on the yeah, passwords. It, yeah, and, and in some places, it, it may not be possible. Um, you may have workers that, that aren't allowed to carry a, a secondary factor device with them when they're working. Um, you know, no cell phone policy. Um, so there, there's no chance to do it. So when you're when they're interfacing with with cloud email, which is accessible from the entire world, how can you secure that user to only say, "Hey, you're only allowed," you know, you 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 know, you can't carry a phone, so you can't get an MFA. So you know, what's the alternative? You know, do you go to a hardware token or do you use a uh, a conditional access policy? Right at that point, and say, "Hey, you can only access your email from this environment, and that's it." So there has I, to and be that's, that's not a terrible idea either. I, I mean, no. saying that these these are the only IP addresses that you can log into your email uh, from. Um, right. the, the idea is to get a compensating control that allows you to achieve the same thing, or the or or in the spirit of the same control that you're trying to satisfy. Right, so. You know, you have to be dynamic in environment. Every business is different. You know, every environment, every user is different, right? I, I don't want your, and, and here's the thing, right? Some some push technologies, some MFA technologies, you know, if, if I come in and say, hey, you know, I want, you know, we're using Okta and I don't want to pay for the SMS tokens for authorization. So you have to use push. Well, you install Okta on your phone and now Okta, you know, Okta reports everything back from that phone based on the policy that it was associated with. So now the business has, you know, my location information, my IP addresses, what version of the phone I'm on, what iOS or, or Android version. Um, you know, why does it need access to my photos? Why does it need access to my call history? So a lot of these liabilities are, are, are are causing a lot of pushback from from our end users who are actually very educated in the mobile space, right? I I would say my niece, my eleven year old niece, knows more about app permissions on her phone than I do because she interfaces with that with that device so much. 
So there's a lot of there's a lot of compensating controls that we have to look at from a governance standpoint to say, hey, you know, maybe maybe we can find a different way to 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 have the same impact or this or the same effect, but yet not just require MFA. You know, it's it MFA is not is not the end all be all to everything. It's it's a huge help, ninety nine percent help, but it's not. It's not that extra one percent. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to summarize what we've gone through so far, and then we're going to talk about the contentious conversation Pete and I were having, and <laughs> Kate was having before we started, which is, you know, patching machines. It's, it, you know, if you haven't done it a long time, you've got a lot of technical debt. You've got to, you got, you got to pay off that debt, and it, it might upset your customer. But tell them why, um, or, or you, allow listing. You know, only allow software you need. Ring fencing. Close down ports. Um, ThreatLocker can help you see this, what ports are being used centrally in one place with our network controls, and you can close them down. You can use dynamic ACLs. If you need to open them to certain locations at certain times, use dynamic ACLs rather than forgetting to remove things from your firewall. Take away administrative permissions. We didn't actually discuss this. I, I, I want to address one point on it, and I don't know if you want to add anything to it, is taking away administrative permissions does not stop ransomware running in your environment. It doesn't stop cyber attacks running, no. but it is good cyber security hygiene. So when somebody's in your environment, their ability to move laterally is massively reduced by taking away administrative permissions. Credentials, Office 365, whether it's dual factor, have some kind of second authentication on those, whether it's conditional access policies. And look, everyone's going to have different needs and different policies. Um, End user training. How effective is it, and why do we? Where is it effective, and where is it complete garbage? Pete, do you want to go, or do you want me to? Well, is it effective? Of course, it's effective. Is it better than nothing? It's better than nothing. Is it a hundred percent effective? Of course not. But if if we acknowledge that the end user is one of the weak links to an enterprise, you have to do something. And either either IT is important to the organization. Um, or it's nothing but an expense. And so if we, want, if we want to help organizations view their technology department as a strategic advantage against their competition, then raising the conversation about educating end users is a natural, uh, is a natural way to pull the thread. You want to keep security and good governance at the, at the forefront of everybody, but we're not going to be able to expect every end user to grasp technology. They may be great at marketing. They may be great at accounting. They may be great in the legal department, but that doesn't mean they're great with technology. So acknowledging the importance is one thing, um, but acknowledging that there's also going to be some additional tools necessary is even more important. Yeah. Security awareness training is like the fourth leg of the stool. Um, you got security awareness training, you got endpoint protection, you got email and web filtering, and then and then MFA. I mean, I mean that's it for for users. I mean, you can't you can't ask them to do anything more. But but with security awareness training, you really have to incentivize the end user to actually engage in their training. I mean, how many of us have sat there and blasted through a you know a phishing training that you know we've gotten? Um, it it you know you have to give them a carrot. You you can't just you can't just so hey you have to do this because it's for, it's required. You have to say hey if you finish this, you know we're going to give you uh, you know points inside our company store, right? We want you we, we want you to be engaged. We want you to bring you into the security environment and understand that like hey every fifth email that you identify you're going to get a five dollar gift card. You will have people clicking valid emails from their boss as phishing attempts in order to in order to get a card but the th the idea is is that you're engaging the population you're changing the culture you're going from oh i have to do this training you know that i'm really not going to pay attention to and just breathe through it so i can get it done for the year to where like hey i actually need to be part of this because you know i'm identified as a risk but I'm also going to get something out of it for my own good, for my time and my effort to do it. And, and, and that's really what we need to do with security awareness training. We just can't sign up for the no befores and the bullfish and, and send randomized trainings to our end user. We have to, we have to be upfront. We have to keep them engaged. We have to let them learn and let, let them show us how much they've learned. But what so that's, percentage that's did you get improved? What Sorry? percentage of clicks, of bad clicks, do you think you reduce? through everyone going through training? 
Oh, well, yeah, so need to know what your guess is. <laughs> yeah, so I've actually done this um, in in a previous environment. Um, so I, I went after my my user environment, which th- people were pissed to be honest. Like some people were so upset, they're like, "I don't want to. E- I'm not doing email anymore. Only fax me from now on." Right, <laughs> and that's how that's how divisive it was when this went out. We caught eighty six percent of the organization on a click. Right, I sent it. Hey, this is the help desk click this thing, you know, you're going to, so it was targeted, it was spearfished, but hey, we we got the entire organization. We went through, we actually said, hey, you know, you you can either, you'll get $5 every time you, you finish this, you you know, via via either an Amazon or Walmart, or you can donate, right? We had three different um, uh, local groups that you could donate to. And it went down to 6% in three months from that initial hit. I mean, people really started started to pick it up. We averaged about $2,200 a year in donations. A lot of people didn't take the Starbucks cards, right? They didn't take the Walmart cards. They all just donated whatever they saw, whatever, whenever they went through the training, they just donated it back to the local community, which was, which was fantastic. So we highlighted it. We, you know, we, we actually, you know, t- talked about it at the holiday party and, and we laughed about it too, because a lot of people would forward phishing emails from their bosses, which we saw and be like, hey, I think this is a phishing email. And then the boss would come back and be like, no, this is your actual email. Well, I, I think that's where some of the, <laughs> the, the problem lies is, is how do yeah. we, because quite often people, they don't necessarily learn how to identify a true phishing email. What they do is they become super paranoid. And, and I kind of think there's right. there's one there's one thing, yeah, look, I, I think you have to do it. Um, I, I think the investment in it, and bear in mind, we're not just talking about the, the $10,000 you pay a year for the license on it or whatever the size of your business is, depends where it goes. Where the investment is huge because it's much, much bigger than um, a user you know, having to request a new application or someone putting a dual factor. We're talking about hours of someone's time over a year, that, and we're talking that multiplied by the number of employees you have. So it's the thing. I think the reason it works is not because people are scared of clicking on phishing emails. I I think it works because people are scared of having to do more training. Now, maybe I'm more of a stick yeah. man than a carrot man because they clicked on a phishing email and they get so, and look, I found it myself. I've got something, and I know if you just click on a link and open a web page, they're not stealing your data unless they've managed to exploit your browser. But I found a situation where you get an email on your phone and you think it's legitimate, say it's an email from FedEx. And it looks like a legitimate email, but on the phone, you can't hover over to see if it's actually going to FedEx on the link. So I'm just like, I'm not checking this delivery because I don't want to get that. Uh, 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 you got fish. <laughs> uh, uh, like, even though I know that I don't get fish just by clicking on the, the link. But but I, I think it makes people more conscious that the fishing simulation and training in general, that if I get stung, I'm going to have to do this and I don't want to do it. It's... Does it give the same ROI as anything else on this list? My thought is no. Uh, is it worth it? Yeah, of course it's worth it. The more security is the better. But when you think about the investment you put in people going through training, should you do it? Yes. Is the ROI there? Probably not. Um, and definitely, I think it's You know, more- and, and there's another factor to it too, Danny. And that is sometimes you find people who explain to their CEO, I, I thought it was a phishing email. I didn't open it. And so you want to be able to get away from putting wind in the sails of the people that are not carrying their weight. And I've had CEOs explain to me that there's some some secondary or tertiary benefits of it as well. Well, look, and it also helps you as a business, as an IT professional, show how vulnerable your users are and allow you to put other controls in place. So uh, so, so, yeah. speaking of, so speaking of that, like how many people are able to enforce how many companies have the structure in place to enforce complex and lengthy passwords? You know, Gabe, you, you gave an example where you built um, a white hack hack uh, to go and fish passwords, right? And, and so you, you hacked your coworkers. Yeah. You put up on the screen, what was it, 100 different passwords and highlighted the ones in yellow that, that had been hacked from your coworkers? Yeah, so uh, so I ran Hashcat against the environment in order to, you know, really really show users, you know, a little bit about about password strength and 
you know, the importance of having, you know, passwords of length and things like that. So, so I displayed it on the board in the middle of a company presentation. And I was like, Hey, if you see your password up here, you need to change it. Yeah. Yeah. You need, you need to change it. And if you're using this password anywhere else on the internet, you need to change it. I was like, uh, it's extremely easy to get these and it's extremely easy for anyone else to get them. So, so I, I think, you know, and that was partially rationalizing that, you know, just, just the, the idea of, of the password segment, you know, password security. But here's, here's the other thing, you know, we haven't even touched on AI or ML in this conversation. And, you know, the, the, a new password attack called Password GAN, which is a uh, generative adversarial network utility based on chat GTP, they say now it can crack 81% of all passwords under 12 characters or 12 characters are under in less than a day in like in like 14 or 16 hours. So uh, I, I, I think one thing that people haven't taken into account, you, you, you ran that attack on the hashes. Sure. And I do, I do want to be clear. Like if, if you're talking about a web account that doesn't have a hash database that you can hit, you cannot attack an office 365 password uh, because they the server will not reply to you quick enough to do, give you a true or false answer um when you run a, a hash database so if someone's able to get the database and now that's not to say you shouldn't have strong it, they're, they're able to run it much much faster uh, which is yeah. why knockouts and delays and slowdowns are so important sure. as security functions Right. And, and it, it's a, that's a different threat model, right? So uh, they're going to look for password reuse at that point. They're not, they're not going to try to brute force. No way. No, they're going to find it, which is why you shouldn't reuse your passwords because if right. they get one person's database, they can do a hashtag on it and then they can run it against other accounts. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, we're kind of running out of time. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've got any last statements you want to finish out on what, what, what do you, what would you recommend people go home and do right now? If they're in cybersecurity or if they're an IT guy or if they're an MSP, what would be the next thing you'd recommend that they focus on to improve their business? I, I think I think you have to have, you have to develop a cybersecurity strategy. Um, you have to identify your risk and priorities. Um, you know, it should outline goals, objectives, steps inside your environment and what it takes, what it will take to achieve them. You know, you should include everything from, from budget and costing, um, you know, based on the security event, it's the security measures you want to implement. And actually, cause it'll, it'll actually materialize, you know, a, you know, it'll make you understand your, your threat landscape, uh, your, your risk, um, and also the amount of, of potential liability or cost savings you can give to the organization. So you, so you have to do that. If you don't have a, have a full cybersecurity strategy, then, then really you, you're just kind of weighing in at this point. Um, you, you have to have that foundational governance, a foundational base in order to, to, to move yourself or the organization that you're working for or working with forward. You know, if we did an exercise looking back 20 years and looking back 30 years, but if you look forward, 10 years, is technology more important or less important to the success of your business? And if you look at your competition, are they going to view technology as more important or less important? And so if you want to succeed and thrive in the, thrive in the coming decade, you have to grasp the importance of technology. And therefore, you have to think about it in terms of ROI models and how you can use technology to get ahead of your competition. Um, and I think that mindset is really important. I think we can get lost in the bits and the bytes, the ones and the zeros. But if you come up to the strategic level, um, everything that we do for our clients should be helping them get ahead of their com competition. I'm, I'm going to finish out on an answer to the question because we had one question which we didn't organically answer, which was we need to make sure vendors have a SOC 2 type 2. It's not necessarily all vendors have to have one, but measure the risk see what they're doing, what access they have to your systems, you know, what type of software it is. If it's installing on your agents, you want to take more security and you can mitigate the risks if they don't. You can use things like ring fencing, you can use things like allow listing to reduce that risk, but definitely it's a good idea. And you know what, if you ask them for it and they don't have it, the more people that ask them, the more likely they're going to go and get some basic hygiene checks themselves. So, so the, what, what do we say about vendors who do not want to share their certificate of insurance for cyber insurance? 
Asking a vendor for cyber insurance, we will not share our certificate of insurance. We have it, it's in our SOC 2 report that it's audited that we have it, we will not share our limits. It's a really bad practice to share your limits. Uh, but asking them for insurance is not taking away the risk. All it's doing is making sure you can sue them for a certain amount of money when they you get breached. And look, at the end of the day, have your own cyber insurance. I mean, that's risk transfer. And you're just saying that, hey, I don't want to use my insurance. I want to use someone else's insurance. Uh, we have a SOC report. Our SOC report says that we will maintain a cybersecurity and policy and that they audit that. We do not share our COI. Absolutely not. And you should avoid sharing your COI if you can. Some people are just going to insist on it. Um, but it, I wouldn't tie up on a, somebody, whether it's a vendor, whether it's a, a partner you're dealing with, them having cyber insurance, because all cyber insurance is doing is saying that I've got an insurance company to sue if they mess up my business. And guess what? <laughs> that million dollar coverage, $5 million coverage, $2 million coverage may not cover it anyway. And quite often that lawsuit is going to go on so long that you'll be out of business by then anyway. So uh, get your own cyber insurance policy um, and let them figure out how to sue who was responsible for the actual breach. But really make sure you've got hygiene and make sure you you mitigate the risks against any, any software you're running, any venue you're using. Think about what could they do to me and how do I mitigate those risks? If I'm deploying an RMM, what can the RMM do? It can push out uh, software. So it can push out malware, it can push out ransomware. How can I mitigate that? I can use allow listing. I can put ring fencing. I can put scheduled policies in place. I can do things. I can put dual factor on it. I can make sure it's not open to the internet. All of these things are ways of mitigating the risk. Uh, the insurance, look, when you start talking about insurance, it's like talking about backup. That's after it's too late. You should have them in place, but that shouldn't be your primary focus. If we think about what you can do next, Make a list, whether you choose the list that we've just gone through here or whether you choose, um, you know, essential eight from Australia is a really good. I know that's a strange list to say, but the Australian government, instead of giving you 78 controls, they gave you eight controls because <laughs> they figured if I give people eight, they're more likely to do them if I give them 78. Uh, but pick a list, whether it's essential eight, whether it's CIS controls level one, two and then three, go through that list and then move on to the next list. That That's you've got to do something uh, quite often. You know, I'm not, I'm not against creating strategy. I'm not against building a plan, but don't spend your time building a plan when you haven't shut down port 3389 on your firewall. Do things in a technical and controllable fashion. The The biggest risk redu reduction, the biggest reward, that's that's what I'd start on. Of course, do a demo at Threat Locker if you're not already using Threat Locker because that'll help check off a lot of items on that list. Gabe, Pete, I really appreciate you joining me today and uh, you know i think it's been a great conversation hopefully our audience has got uh, some value out of it